Now, folks, we're sitting here with Gary Milievsky. He's a cybersecurity expert at several companies in cybersecurity. He was one of the founders of the Department of Homeland Security. He worked, for example, on the National Vulnerability Database. And he has some insights on what's happened with this election. So, Gary, it's a real pleasure being here with you. It's an honor to be here. Thanks, Joshua. Now, Gary, I, I know you've been looking at the allegations of election fraud. If you were to look at this whole picture, uh, based on the evidence we've seen, is there fraud? Would you say there's fraud that took place? Let's say one American citizen was involved in seeing election fraud and they sign an affidavit. That might be true, might not be true. But there are thousands of affidavits in the president's hands right now about election fraud across the nation. There's election gear that was turned on to the internet, which violates the FEC regulations. Federal Election Commission in 2014 said, keep the gear offline, no internet connectivity, no wireless, and yet the uh, you know 30 states and maybe more had gear that was allowed to get a patch or software update over the internet. Then we count how many people voted in various counties and states, and we count how many registered to vote, and there's an overage, i.e. more people voted than registered to vote en masse, and the list goes on. You know, and things showing up at 4 a.m., such as hundreds of thousands of ballots with just one checkbox for Joe Biden. Not all, you know, down ballot voting. So there's rampant fraud. There's enough evidence that you can't summarily dismiss it. And there's got to be deep investigations by the Federal Election Commission and the Department of Justice into how much fraud was actually done nationwide. And I believe it is massive and so significant, it is rocking the foundation of you and me having a one right to one person voting in this country. Now, Gary, you're one of the founders of the Department of, Department of Homeland Security. The DHS actually came out, the head of it, former at least, uh, came out and said pretty much there's, you know, this is a secure election, no issues with fraud. What would you say to that? I'd say he's a shill for someone because that's like saying Microsoft Windows should not run antivirus, never be patched, and not have a firewall. Every day the Microsoft operating system, which costs billions of dollars to make, every day it has a new update and a new vulnerability listed at the National Vulnerability Database, nvd.nist.gov. In other words, software is extremely vulnerable. We should not be using software in our elections, software and hardware combinations, one with internet connectivity, Two, with the ability to have physical access to the gear with admin permissions. Three, with a way to patch update them remotely and not see what the patch was. We need to have open source to anything, the ability to read how this functions for all citizens to see, for mathematicians and computer scientists and cybersecurity experts to say, I validated that this is good gear and it works right. We haven't had access to any of that. And this stuff was used across the nation. Hmm. Now. You worked again on this national vulnerability database, uh, looking at flaws, uh, holes exactly like this. What have you seen in terms of vulnerabilities in the election system, especially with the, say, electronic votes? Every piece of electronic gear that has an internet connectivity, i.e. a wireless router connection uh, or a physical ethernet connection is a vulnerable piece of equipment that can be hacked remotely from other nations who have access to our, we don't block our internet, we don't have a great wall like China where we control traffic coming and going from America. So you can remotely hack our gear from other countries. The company itself could have done a bad patch update for just you know the Dominion as an example, or AccuVote or other gear. So there are ways to get into this equipment that is uh, way beyond what you know the average citizen would believe. And that means we're looking at extremely vulnerable equipment. And you know, there's a group every August that gets together in Las Vegas every year. And the media used to cover this every year, and since 2018, they've quieted down saying, no, don't listen to these people. They hack all voting gear within minutes during DEF CON in a hack the vote activity that goes on for a few days. They grab a piece of the gear, they find a hole, and they show it off and they write reports in August of every year. And it happened again this year, and we're not hearing that in the news. Now, Gary, I know you follow these things. What, what happened at the Hack the Vote conference this year during that section of DEF CON? One person was able to get into the Dominion gear in two minutes. If you have physical access, you can pull out the hard drive and then get admin permission to change voting. You can change the, the way the, the equipment allows votes to be counted so that, it, Josh, if you and I were running for president, I could say Josh gets 200 votes for one click by one citizen 
and Gary gets one vote by one click for one citizen. 200 to 1. You could make it 1,000 to 1. Or you could use the salami method and make it 0.8 to 1.2. So it slowly gives you more votes than me, but it's hard to tell if you don't have physical access to the gear and if you don't forensically analyze what happened. Then there's other things that hackers were able to do. Connect to the gear over the internet and send patch updates and changes. One of my friends who's a top hacker took Diebold's gear and installed a game in five minutes. Literally turned the whole voting gear into a game called Doom. That means the gear is not secure. So you can change the way it functions, you can modify the code, you can get over the internet and change and modify what's happened in the gear. And if you have physical access, you can totally quickly uh, modify how it counts votes. And the list goes on. And there's so many holes and so many back doors. You literally would have to go to um, DEF CON's website or go to uh, Black Hat's website and download these reports and read how much has been done to get into all this equipment. And it's very, very frightening. Now, now Gary, can you explain to us what this salami method is? So imagine you bought a big salami, right? And you're making sandwiches for your family. So what they talk about is if I just slice little pieces when you're not looking, I just keep slicing little thin pieces. After a while, I might get half your salami before you notice. So if you slice off 0.2 for every vote away from one candidate, say Donald Trump, you can give that 0.2 to the other candidate. So Joe Biden could get a 1.2 vote. He got a tiny extra piece of salami. My sandwich is thinner than yours, but I didn't notice. I got two pieces of bread and a thinner piece of salami than you. My vote was 0.8, your vote was 1.2. That's the salami method, just slicing little bits, and it's been used for years. Hackers use it to steal money from banks by slicing percentages of pennies off, and nobody noticed with rounding up and rounding down errors until it was too late, and millions of dollars were stolen. The same method can be used to steal millions of votes. Now, Gary, I understand this electronic voting system, right? So, like, for example, Dominion. Some of these systems actually do have technology built into them to change the way votes are weighed. So it's not one person, one vote. It's one person, 1.5 votes, or one, point, one person, you know, 0 0.8 votes. Um, I, have you seen evidence of this? I or guess, every time. 20 or every 100 votes, add an extra 15 votes to one candidate. It's called an algorithm. And yes, I believe in this election there was a patch update, at least on the Dominion system in 30 states, where the patch needs to be reviewed and analyzed as part of a crime scene. The Department of Justice needs to get a hold of the Dominion gear that was used in all these states and other gear, maybe AccuVote and some other gear, and actually analyze why were they connected to the Internet, which violates the FEC's ruling from 2014. Federal Election Commission said no internet connectivity. It makes sense. Why would you want to have gear connected to the internet unless you want to be able to modify it over the internet? Second, what changes or, or modifications were made to the algorithms used to determine the votes? And why are there algorithms at all? Right? It's your vote or my vote. It's one vote. So an algorithm, it can have a random seed. It can have a math, you know, statistical and mathematical analysis that says every time 80 votes go by, let's just give you know, Joe Biden 15 more than Donald Trump. Let's make it hard to notice. Now every time 200 votes go by, let's give Joe Biden 12. Now every time 300 go by, let's give him 32. That's an algorithm. That's not normal voting. This gear should have one fingerprint, one ID, one, one registered voter like we did for the you know, Operation Iraqi Freedom, but it doesn't. It has algorithms, and they're proprietary and private, and they need to be made open. We should never touch or trust any piece of computer hardware or software for voting that can connect to the Internet, that can be patch updated, that is vulnerable, and that can have an algorithm in it. That's the problem. Now let's stick a bit deeper into this algorithm issue, because that's a good point. Normally, we would assume that you push a button, it's one vote. One person, one vote, and that's how the system works. How would an algorithm alter this? I, now, from what I understand, an algorithm would be like a, a pattern of a code that alters something based on a certain pattern. Is that accurate, and how would you describe this uh, to our audience? An example is, let's say you bought a new car, and it has that push-button starter. And every time you push that button, the car would start maybe on the 12th time, so you have to push it 12 times. An hour later, you could push it every time, and it would start. Two hours later, it might start randomly based on just a, a random seed. Let him start the car if I feel like it. So you could write code to ruin a person's experience driving a car. 
Every time I hit start, I get a random experience or I get a different experience or I get a patterned experience. So one vote is one bit or one byte turned on, you know, one or zero. And that's a non-algorithm. That's like, you know, a punch card. You get a, you get a vote or you don't get a vote. An algorithm can be so complex or so random appearing that it's hard to tell if fraud was done until you analyze the algorithm and say, this is odd. Heuristic analysis shows that one candidate has patterns of votes that don't make any sense. And that's what statisticians and mathematicians have said about our election. They noticed that in many states, more people voted than were registered. That means the algorithms behaved in a certain way that gave more votes to one candidate that didn't exist. Votes that didn't exist were added or tallied so that one candidate got more votes than real registered citizens. Now let's jump into what the FEC has said. You mentioned that the FEC, for example, made it so that elections could not have systems connected to the internet. Uh, you've seen evidence that this may have been violated. What, what, what happened at that time that they made that law? So in 2014, just over the river in Virginia, somebody took a computer with maybe a Pringles can connected, we call it an antenna, and they aimed it and found election gear. They could be a quarter of a mile away, they could be in the parking lot where the vote was taking place. And that's called wireless hacking, the same way the largest breach in history of TJ Maxx was done. You have a directional antenna, you have wireless, and they actually use Pringles cans to do it. They're running something like Linux, an operating system, not Windows or not Macintosh, on their computer. And they're looking for wireless signals. They find one. They notice a wireless signal is connected to a piece of equipment that's running an operating system. They find out that it's voting gear. They say, you know what, I'm going to give Josh an extra thousand votes today because I feel like it. That happened in Virginia. The FEC found out about it, the Federal Election Commission, FEC.gov, and they said, this doesn't make sense. Why would any voting gear be accessible to hackers over wireless, over Wi-Fi? So all voting gear after 2014 was supposed to not have any form of internet connectivity, especially wireless. There's two ways to get to you know, a piece of voting gear now. Physically plugging in an ethernet port and putting it on the public internet, or turning on its wireless router and giving it a wireless IP address or its wireless receiver and getting it on another wireless connection to the internet. And it appears that Dominion had wireless connectivity in 30 states. Hmm. Now Gary, uh, there's been a lot of talk about this tabulation system that was allegedly had played a role in the fraud that may have taken place. What is this tabulation system? How does the tabulation system work? So when you run votes through the gear, through the software hardware system, it uses what's called optical character recognition to recognize, you know, normally it's down ballot voting, people just vote all red or vote blue, but you might have a mix. And it sees each vote on who you're voting for. Maybe it's a state rep, maybe it's a governor, maybe it's the president, and then it tabulates that and it puts it in its records and then it outputs and prints results. And what uh, the ballot people managing the ballots at these places are supposed to do is audit the results and count votes and print, you know, take the votes out of the machine and randomly check to see, hey, uh, this tabulated that there were 82 votes for Donald Trump and there were 79 votes for Joe Biden or 179 for Biden and 50 for Trump. And when we pull out ballots, we're noticing that those numbers are correct. Now, they don't want to count all ballots. That's why they bought this gear. So if the tabulation is the results that come out, a summary of the results are not audited, then we just say, okay, those are the results and you send it off to the mainstream media. And what happened is you can notice that tabulation was occurring during the election at about 10 p.m. at night. And if you play back CNN in slow motion in milliseconds, there's an example in one state where Donald Trump had 80,000 more votes than Joe Biden from tabulation, but then it changed, it flipped. And then Joe Biden had 80,000 more than Donald Trump. So they actually moved votes from one candidate to another. How that happened is pretty interesting and it needs to be analyzed. So the tabulation wasn't done right. That's not correct. It needs to be audited. Hmm. Now, Gary, I'm curious, based on, again, your research, going to these hacker conferences, watching how these systems have, in fact, been hacked, has there been evidence, for example, at these hacker conferences of people successfully altering votes as they come in or doing things like this or demonstrating it? Every time. Uh, hack hacking uh, the vote, uh, HBO did a special. There's a guy everybody I know in cybersecurity trusts, Hugh Thompson. He's the chairman or has been the chairman of the RSA conferences, the biggest 
cybersecurity conferences in the world. And he and his friend, who are experts at what's called penetration testing, they were able to modify voting gear in a matter of minutes. And when people then went trusting the gear to do their vote, they showed the results were skewed the way they wrote the algorithm, the way they modified the software very quickly, in fact. And now, if you just physically get access to Dominion, you don't need to write code. You just change the numbers. You change the patterns. You say, I want to give Josh 200 votes every time someone clicks the button for one vote. That's how easy it is. Every single time it's been done at these hacking conferences in a matter of minutes. It doesn't take hours or weeks or months. Have we seen evidence that this may have been done? Is there any way to tell if this has been done based on what we've been seeing? Well, based on thousands of affidavits that are in the hands of the White House, it seems, and the Federal Election Commissioner has stated that he's seen the affidavits, he believes there should be no summarily dismissed case that this is real. Uh, there needs to be an analysis on the Dominion and other voting hardware that had internet connectivity and or patch updates happening a day before the election or maybe even during the election. So those pieces of gear should be considered parts of a crime scene, evidence of a crime scene. And the Department of Justice should gain access to that equipment as soon as possible hmm. and analyze what happened. Now Gary, of course you're one of the founders of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, part of what Operation Iraqi Freedom did, which you know, is part of the founding of, of uh, DHS, of course, was focused on the war on terror. Uh, part of what the U.S. did was established an election system in Iraq. And I assume that was based on an assessment of what would constitute a valid election system that can't be rigged because you have threats and problems in these types of countries. What did the U.S. create uh, and how was that assessed in terms of why they chose that path? Go to your favorite search engine and type in Operation Iraqi Freedom Vote Purple Finger. They have purple ink for their fingerprint uh, during the vote. And they're so proud, men and women, women weren't voting in Iraq before Iraqi Freedom, that you have one fingerprint, one real ID to show that I am this person and that I'm a registered voter. So it's one registered voter for one vote, one real ID for one fingerprint. Those are the three parts of what we would call multi-factor authentication. I've authenticated your fingerprint, I've authenticated your ID, and you are a registered voter. I'm not counting you twice or three times or running algorithms. So Operation Iraqi Freedom, after billions of dollars were spent, we gave a small country in the Middle East the ability to have unhackable votes that we don't have here in America. Hmm. Now, a lot of Americans, they go to the polls, and the basis of our government is that we elect our leaders. We choose who is in charge of the country. This is the basis of the American system of government. Now, this is based on good faith, believing that your vote counts and believing that the person you put on that box is going to be the one that you have cast your vote for, and that's going to be counted, and it's going to be fair. Um, that the integrity of that is now at risk because people no longer really believe that their votes were counted fairly. There's a lot of allegations around voter fraud. Um, in terms of what the U.S. has done, based on the integrity of our systems, based on making sure things are verifiable, making sure there's no holes in the systems, what has been done in the U.S. election system to make sure fraud doesn't take place? Very little. In fact, more has been done to claim that there's a secure election going on than actual uh, activity to secure the election. One, we have voting gear made by vendors that have connections to Venezuela, Cuba. You know, some gear was in Germany collecting and counting votes, tabulating votes in another country. Spain, we have a software company. Venezuela, we have a software company that's part of our vote. Uh, where the founder who you'd like to interview and ask him, you know, how did you design your software died in a plane crash. So we have a problem. You know, Houston, there's a problem. If we could only analyze the code being used, and by the way, it should not be complex. It should be simple code. Instead, it's algorithmic code that already is a red flag, that voting systems are using algorithms. That's a problem right there. Anyone who says to a state government, I want to sell you voting here, by the way, you can use it. It has an algorithm and it has patch updates. And if you feel like it, you can flip a few bits and change it so that one candidate gets 200 votes for every time one citizen clicks. Houston, we have a problem. So right now, we have voting gear across the nation that has not made open source, that has not been analyzed. 
you know, think about when you're online shopping during the holidays, you know, Black Friday or uh, <clears throat> one of these, you know, days you feel like going online, maybe shopping for Christmas or something. You go to Amazon or Walmart, or you go to one of these websites, and they're using a encryption algorithm that is open source called TLS or SSL, Secure Sockets Layer Transport Layer Security, and your browser gives you a secure connection, and when you put your credit card in, if that browser isn't being eavesdropped by some malware on your computer, between your browser and the store, they comply with the regulation, you know, PCI, the Payment Card Industry Standard, where between you and me, you know, you're the vendor and I'm, I'm the consumer and I'm buying goods from you, it's totally secure and it's encrypted. If someone said, I don't trust that algorithm, guess what? It's completely open. The NSA has analyzed it. Mathematicians and scientists have analyzed it. They tell you how long it takes a supercomputer to hack into your transaction called man in the middle attack. But we have no knowledge about the algorithms used in the voting gear in America. It's not open source. It's not been analyzed by experts like myself, mathematicians, computer scientists, cybersecurity forensics experts. We have no idea what this stuff is doing. That's a big problem. Now, Gary, I guess if we were just to you know, explain this to our audience, in terms of the problems you've been seeing with these elections, based on cybersecurity, based on what we've been watching for years, um, can anything be done? Based on what we, based on what happened, could there be audits? Could there be investigations? What can be done at this point? So right now, we need to find out who has had physical access to all of this voting gear that has algorithms, that have software and internet connectivity, and has had patch updates. That gear are all part of a crime scene. The Department of Justice needs to get a hold of that gear. They need to look at camera footage and say who went in and out of the rooms with that gear, who physically modified it. Um, you know, post-election, has somebody tried to forensically clean it up? We need to get forensic experts to see what's called ghosted data fields on the hard drive. Maybe somebody tried to clean up the patch. Maybe they repatched it to remove the algorithm that messed with the votes, right? Make it look like it's back to normal, where maybe it's only one-to-one. -one. So we need that gear to be treated as crime scene uh, equipment, you know, parts of a crime scene, like a gun or a knife that was seen at, at the scene of the crime. And it needs to be analyzed. Uh, I believe that we need our federal government and our federal election commission to get more serious with Congress and the Senate and the President, and forget an executive order, this is all across our nation. We need to say, look, the states do have Tenth Amendment rights. They should be able to buy what they want, do what they want. But when it comes to a national vote, the outcome needs to be true, attestable, and correct. That won't happen when different states are buying different gear from different vendors that say it's proprietary. I can't show you my secret sauce on how my gear works. That's a problem. And we can look back and remember Operation Iraqi Freedom Look back, remember Operation Iraqi Freedom and the one finger, one vote. This has to happen in America. We have to use your driver's license, your registration to vote, and something like your fingerprint. Something has to match. We call it multi-factor authentication. If we did multi-factor authentication on voting, you're really Joshua, you're really there to vote, and you only got one vote, and your vote counted, that's great. But right now, that's not how it's working. Hmm. Gary, things seem to be on crossroads. Thanks for having me at Crossroads. Really appreciate it.